Well, welcome to a new Harry's Farm video. And uh, since we last did a video, well, it just has hardly stopped raining. Fortunately, we've got the sun now, but we have had in June now, 70 mil of rain. And last Thursday, 44 mil of rain. And the following day was about six or seven. So the farm looks completely different. Um, I'm starting, what I'm gonna do with this video is just have a quick look around the farm, what's going on, and then just discuss cropping and what we do next year and just go into a little bit of the financials of how it all works and why we're beholden to the government and agricultural bills all sorts of things but first of all let's have a look at the crop now this is linseed so this crop is now what we term senescing uh, that means of ripening for harvest it's naturally going off just see it starting to change color this is a rich green color and now it's putting all its energy into um, actually fill in the pods uh, if i just pick one here all those pods there i don't know if you can see there they're sort of changing from yellow to there and then they're green all at different stages and i'm waiting for the seeds inside there if we actually just go a little bit further down if i pick some of it has sort of ripened a bit quicker i think it's it almost droughted out so yeah if you look at that one um it's not as nearly as green as this one. So this is one that's sort of droughted out. And if I open those pods there, there we are. You just see some seeds there. They should be a darker brown. I'm looking for a darker brown seed that will then, if I, I can, I will spray this off. We use a desiccant that basically ripens the crop very evenly. Um, we used to use a chemical called Reglone and that unfortunately has been banned this year so we're using glyphosate roundup this year and it's not quite as good and the timing is absolutely critical um, reglone was was like something that hit the plant and then killed the bits it touched glyphosate roundup actually has to go through the crop it trans the crop needs to be growing for it to be effective so the timing is very critical you can't wait until it's all gone dark brown because the crop has died and nothing will um, go through the, the actual plant itself to kill it um, evenly. So you have to do it when it's slightly green. So the timing is critical because if you go too early, you don't get yield. If you go too late, you might as well not bothered. But I always do it. it, it just gives a really good entry for wheat. And that's what we're trying to do with this linseed. But I'm just chuffed to bits of how even it is. I've written all round here. Uh, and these odd patches of just slightly darker bits of linseed. And I'm sure that is something to do with the drought. Um, it just started to go off in that really hot weather we had in May, but the vast majority looks really good. So that's the linseed. Let's go off to the bite and I'm gonna show you around a bit more of the farm. Have a look at some other crops. It's another bite this time. This is the Honda Africa Twin, this one. Um, this is, I think it's 1988 or 89, this bike. Um, a real favourite of mine. My son uh, uses this quite a lot and we go off on these adventures and we went off to the Sahara Desert two years ago on this bike into Morocco. It was my birthday celebration and it's a bit scruffy. It always was a bit scruffy but it's particularly scruffy at the moment because Charlie having come back from there never wants to wash it because this mud is authentic Sahara mud. It was wet in some places when we were out there and he never wants to clean it again as memories of this amazing trip out on the dunes, etc. Uh, this Honda is, uh, yeah, it's 90, let's say 1988, I think it is. And the Honda Africa Twin won Dakar four years on the trot. So 86, 87, 88, 89, and then they retired. And this is the machine basically they did it on. Right, I'm going off now. We'll have a look at the wheat. Looks very different. This linseed, yeah, it's looking pretty good as well. Just out of interest, that hedge there, we planted, we put sticks in the ground 15 years ago. And uh, it's an amazingly diverse hedge, this. It's got a lot of hazel in it, that's hazel there. Uh, obviously hawthorn, oh, you can see the hazelnuts just come in there. Um, there's a bit of holly in there as well, just for added variety, but yeah, it's really, it's amazing. If you ever th plant in a hedge, can, it is one of the most satisfying things you can do, especially if you do a, 
pretty diverse one like this. There should be some roses in here. I can't see them. There's maple there, isn't there? Oh, just I'm sure there's a, no roses. But yeah, really nice to thing to do. I have to say, very very satisfying. Something I'd like to do more on. You can see the the hazelnuts just come in there and up there, aren't they? The squirrels will be all over them soon. Anyway, let's go and have a look at some wheat. Right, just before we go into the wheat, I just wanted to show you down here. This all looks very overgrown, but this is actually a bit of a wild flower plot and some wild oats, that's what those are. But I just wanted to show you how amazingly accurate modern sprayers are. Commercial field of wheat, wildflower mix. Look at that line, look how much weed has gone into the wheat, but actually more importantly, how little drift you get from herbicides affecting the wildflower mix. Absolutely to a line, the wildflowers and the wheat mix. And that's down to the accuracy of a modern sprayer and how it doesn't get drift, it just sprays right to within a centimetre, poof, down on that end one, and no weed killer goes on the wildflower mix. Right, this wheat has really come on great guns after all the rain. A remarkable uh, change. This was actually dead here anyway, but we're still getting growth. Just something I wanted to show you up here though. This is, when you get a bare patch like that, and then lots of rain, you, the her you put a herbicide, soil-borne herbicide in just after drilling, which we did here, and that works, but it, it breaks down over time. But then you get all this June rain, this is a slight side effect, uh, the herbicides run out and it just makes everything grow. So we have a field of thistles now, which um, are common mow or something, but uh, yeah, open space like that, it just shows how the herbicide sort of wears out as the months tick by. I just want to show you the, the wheat in here, it's more representative of what the most of the farm looks like. Again here you can see, look at that stour brome. It's just got going because of the amount of moisture we've had, but it's not in the crop. I would have loved to have mown this, but these margins are um, 6 metre margin stewardship and I'm not allowed to mow them until July which is a complete pain because that's going to put seed heads into the crop that I'm going to have to control. But um, yeah, I'll explain more about the area payments. You know, and then again, for those wild oats, you can see how effective the herbicide has been. That's what the rest of the field would look like if it wasn't sprayed right to an edge of the crop. And then we've got, very, we've got one or two wild oats, but nothing like it would grow had we not sprayed. It's a very good example of why you use herbicides. Okay, another field of wheat. Skylark just gone up there. Again, really pleasing to see how clean this wheat is. Yeah, hats off to, I get, yeah, my advisor is by um, Prochem and um, it's done an exceptional job this year really, keeping the crops clean and having a minimum spend. Let's have a look here. You can see how this is where it was all cracked up and now those cracks are sort of gone. And this is the wheat. And what I wanted to show you here just how much good this rain has done. Suddenly we're not stressed. You see that flag leaf, it's not curled at all. It's all exposed to the sun. This is out, this is all growing really well. I'd, it could have been a little taller, but uh, we don't mind that. And if I look inside here, say 30% of the yield is gonna come from this Ear, just photosynthesis via this ear, and there is a grain getting very plump. It's absolutely sort of perfect um, weather now. We're after this 70 mil of rain for that to really plump out. And we'll just test it every now and then. That'll go cheesy. It'll change as we do it. But uh, yeah, it's all doing its growth. There's nothing to slow this down. The only thing I'd say, I would like not to be able to see the rows. 
so it hasn't tillered quite as much as in a normal year so I can sort of see the drill row rows here when I would expect it to be a little bit more joined up but that was that drought in you know May really did the damage April May and then we had the rain in June but now after that rain I think it's going to do all right this much better because as I say 70 percent of the yield is from the flag leaf and the and the ear so it has potential there just might not be as much yield but I suspect there are going to be plump grain and good quality and this is a bread making wheat and that's good news on price <laughs> a little bit more droughted out but and then soil type change again much greener up here heavier soil up here it's just bizarre you know after all these years of farming I have no idea what the yield is going to be this year I never had conditions like it but you yeah we're predicting it's well down on a normal year but uh, trying to guess what that number is who knows there we are, these, these are my two worst fields of wheat and you can almost see a crop out there now it's sort of, it really is trying to grow and behave like a normal field of wheat you can see how much that has grown, that's come up, the ears are uh, much taller than the flag leaf now I have, again, no idea what it's going to yield, but we have a crop there <laughs> that's all I want, it's a little shorter than it should be but I'm chuffed to bits that that rain came just in time really to save this but a lot of it looks more like this let's see we've got that rust out just in time the rust has gone uh, that's a reasonably healthy crop you can see how it's smaller eared it's not the same uh, yield potential as that field of wheat we we're just looking at but at least it's not under stress anymore they can grow away, we just haven't spent anything on it and we can think about next year and next year is what I want to talk about next Look how this has grown very different here uh, since the last time here because of this rain and this this mustard this is this um, cover crop this is a, a just a greening crop um, we, we chose this uh, mustard to put roots down to open up this soil this was all flooded um, well a lot of the year from October right round to about March time that's as far as we could drill I don't know if you can hear it pick up on the mic it is alive with skylarks that area over there we leave completely for ground nesting birds and I don't, you can't see them, they go up high they, you get someone coming to a field like this, they fly up and go ooh and start singing from up there um, but it is absolutely alive at the moment anyway, this is the mustard, this has grown like a foot in a week I'll just pull these out, you'll see what's going on, that's got a bend so these are sort of putting a tap root down and that's sort of breaking out the soils. That's the idea, they're deep rooting uh, mustard. And this was all wet and very sad bit of ground and those roots were sort of open it up. So that's the idea. It's got so much moisture, it's gonna go berserk uh, over the next week or two. It's flowering, so it's full of you know bees, butterflies wandering around here. And it's a greening crop. So this is to, we're gonna use this as green manure basically. and come harvest I've now got to think what am I going to put back in these fields this which should be a second wheat as a term I had one wheat after in seed this is the second wheat it should have been wheat right up to here that as we got because of the wet winter what I'm looking at is whether to put an oilseed rape crop where all this second wheat is it's about 120 acres because the breeders are desperate for us to grow oilseed rape again and there is a market there we do need this requirement two million ton requirement in the UK and they're now saying look buy, buy our latest seed of these very vigorous oilseed rape that should get around most of the problems of the flea beetle and if it really doesn't grow by the end of October you haven't got a crop 
we'll compensate you and pay you back 60% of the seed cost. So that's not a bad um, deal really. So I'm looking at doing oilseed rape. I'm also going to mix it up and that's with a, something called a companion crop because it's all about this flea beetle that nabs the plant comes up as a little tiny seedling and it just crucifies the crop and they nibble away at it and kill the crop. But a companion crop means the flea beetle comes along and says, oh, it's a tasty rate. Oh, but I quite like that clover over there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nibble on that rather than the oilseed rate. See if they work. It's the latest trend. We're going to see if that actually works. But cropping, I have to put two crops in because of the single farm payment. If I go into the actual numbers on the farm now, we farm 450 acres or thereabouts, 150 is rented. And I do something that tells me the, the income we're going to get after we sell the crop, but we've paid for the fertiliser, sprays, um, a, a bit of cultivation. So I get the drill, a contractor comes in and does that. Um, so that I charge that against it. And then the sprayer, that big sprayer you've seen working on here, I pay him uh, per acre each time he has to put an application on. And it's known as the sort of gross margin. It, mine is slightly different because I include those little bit of contract charge as well. And the, uh, and the rent on the other ground. And we expect, well, before the rains come, I didn't actually expect to make a profit from that. After the rain, I said, well, we might get to £10,000 profit. And this isn't net profit to me. I'll go into the details on that in a moment. But now after all this rain and how the crop's looking, I think we might be fifteen or 16000 That's on 450 acres. And so I'm completely reliant on the single farm payment. This payment that we get from the government uh, comes from the EU that all farmers received based on the land area they've got. He said, oh, you can farm without it. 16,000, that is before I've charged any machinery that we've got here, the combine, the tractor. I mean, the repayments on the tractor are 29,000 a year. So the 16,000 doesn't go very far it's topped up by this area payment. Otherwise, we just wouldn't be farming. On a farm like this, it's about £20,000 a year. And that added onto the 16, just about makes this a viable business after we've had all those costs um, taken off. So, you know, the, the combined machinery, we spent about, I think it was £10,000, £11,000 on machinery repairs and diesel and things like that last year. Nothing, um, no salaries, no, nothing for me and Charlie on the combine. Don't take that off. So you can see how tight it is farming, even with the single farm payment. And that is going to be taper reduced to, to zero over the next four or five years. And that's why I'm considering how many harvests have I actually got to go? In. It might only be four harvests and then we're selling all machinery, but it just doesn't seem right to me. And at the beginning of the year, uh, Michael Gove announced that basically it's going to be, well, he's announced in 2018, it's going to be phased out by 2024. They're now saying it, it will be around 2027. It will be the total transition period. And in February, they were saying, we're going to change it to an environmental scheme. Didn't mention food once. So at the moment, the idea it came in after, just after the war to absolutely guarantee food supplies. And it's done a very good job of doing that. It's a little bit messy, it's a bit clunky in places, but the trouble is the whole world does it now. America, well not the whole world, but America and Europe, etc., support farmers. If you take the support away from the farmers, we do not compete on the world stage. It's too expensive to grow a crop in the UK, it's smaller um, fields, the world price is basically propped up by all these schemes and we're in a bit of a mess. We can't farm without it, so something needs to be done. I feel after the um, pandemic has hit, it's sort of shown how important local food is to the UK. We shouldn't be thinking, we'll go nice and environmental here. Um, there, there might be a tree scheme I might be interested in, but all it actually does is move your food production overseas. I know there's a slight motive for the government to do that because they've, they've announced this net zero CO2 by 2045. One of the ways they can do that is to shut down farming and thus grow just trees instead. But we're still going to eat and stuff. So we're, all we're doing is actually moving the CO2 to another country, which as far as the planet is concerned, doesn't make a blind bit of difference, but it makes the British government look very good. Oh, look, we've reduced our CO2 
I'm not sure about that. And I think after the pandemic, um, the public will want farm, UK farmers to continue to grow food. So I'm intrigued how it's all going to shape out over the next few months, years. There's an agricultural bill going through uh, Parliament at the moment. There's been a million signatures supporting the NFU um, request that all trade deals are done, that the food we import has to be at the same standard as we are uh, we currently uh, operate to as British farmers. That's all that in the background, the chlorinated chicken and the beef hormones, etc., from the US. But it seems to be gathering support that if we're going to import food, we want it grown to the same standard as we do in the UK. So watch that space. But on the coming all the way back down to the cropping, I'm going to crop this with just two crops and another farm off outline farm, I'm going to just do a solo crop. But under EU rules, I had to grow three crops for greening purposes. It's the most annoying bit of EU regulation I know because they date no notice of the fact that a third of this farm is down to permanent grass and I've got all the environmental uh, schemes in. No, I've got to grow three crops. That's greening. Nothing to do with the grass, nothing to do with the margins, nothing to do with the um, pollen and nectar mixes, etc. I'm hoping that UK and NFE have always been against it. They dropped it for 2020 because of the wet autumn. I'm hoping, gambling, that it won't apply in for the harvest 21. We shall see. But anyway, that's what's going on in Harry's farm. So oh yeah, that's quite a lot of explaining of the background, the politics behind farming. But I think it's probably useful to know how it all the machines work. They've got a lot on their plate at the moment, the UK government. So I quite understand there's not a lot of news coming out at the moment. But as far as the farm goes, it's growing away, it's loved that moisture. We need no more moisture now before harvest. So I'm just preparing now for harvest and what we go and plant for 2021 harvest. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, well, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming along very soon.